Welcome back to Waters Ironworks. We are continuing our journey through the Abana National Curriculum. Uh, we are on uh, section 1.2. We've gotten through the safety work and now we're talking about the nomenclature of the amble, the forge, and the vice, three uh, critical parts of a blacksmith's equipment. So let's take a look at uh, two different, similar, but different ambles that I've got. Um, here in the shop out at Pioneer Farms. This is a TFS 100 pound anvil. Um, <clears throat> it is a very classic London pattern style anvil. And we wanna just kinda of take a look at it, make sure that we can name what all the different parts are. So starting from the front, we have the horn or the bick used for Bending steel, if you want to draw steel out aggressively, you'll see that in some of the later videos. Moving back, we have the step of the anvil. Um, this is on London pattern anvils. It's not going to be on every one of them. Originally, when anvils were manufactured, the base of the anvil would have been wrought iron with a thin um, steel plate on it. This step then and the horn actually would have both been made out of wrought iron. So if you were cutting through with a chisel, you might do that on the step of the anvil so that it wouldn't mess up either your chisel or the face of your anvil. Uh, these days, any modern anvil that you buy is gonna be all cast steel, cast ductile, uh, iron, something along those lines. Everything's gonna be the same hardness, but this is still really useful for shaping things. Continuing our way back then, we have the face of the anvil. That's this whole section here, which is where you're gonna do the majority of your work. There are typically two holes. Um, you've got your hardy hole here to hold any hardy tools that you've got. Cutoffs, uh, swages, all kinds of different things will fit in the hardy hole. And then back here, you have a pritchel hole. Let me magically grab a horseshoe and I'll show you why it's called a pritchel hole. We've got our horseshoe, and a horseshoe has holes in it. These are also pritchel holes, and I don't actually have a pritchel, but this will give you the idea. It was a small tool or a tool that was used to create the holes in the horseshoe. So you have your pritchel, you make the holes in the horseshoe, those are pritchel holes, that's a pritchel hole. Today, it's used for a lot of the same purposes for non-farriers. Um, you're gonna use it when you wanna punch through something and you're supporting the material around what you're punching through. Continuing on down the anvil then, uh, we have the body of the anvil, which kind of makes up this whole section. This part is sometimes called the throat of the anvil. And then down here on the bottom, we've got the feet of the anvil. And that pretty much makes up the standard London pattern style anvil. This is not the only style of anvil you're gonna see. There are a lot of other ones. Uh, you'll see ones with big blocks on the bottom. Those are upsetting blocks for driving hot steel, making it shorter and fatter. You'll see ones uh, that have tables on it. They might have little clips. Um, this one right here is an old uh, hay button barriers anvil. Um, and you'll notice it's got two pritchel holes. Again, you're making horseshoes. You're making pritchel holes in the horseshoe. Having more options help. A lot of barriers anvils now you'll see have a little um, side table um, that's designed or a clipping table that's designed for putting clips on the back of horseshoes, things like that. Um, this anvil is actually old enough that it was, there was a lot of uh, hand forging. It does have a wrought iron base. <clears throat> and if you look on the throat of this anvil, You'll see right here uh, a hole, which is called the handling hole or a handling hole. There's one on the other side. When they were making this anvil, they would have shoved big uh, bars in there and used that to pick up the hot uh, anvil while they were continuing to work on it. There are a wide variety of other anvils. Um, they take a lot of different shapes. We won't cover them all. Uh, this is just a quick example. This is a scythe peening anvil that was designed to be driven into a stump. These prevent it from going in too far. You then put the scythe blade on top of this and hammer down in order to sharpen the scythe. So 
a lot of different styles um, of anvils today. Probably the most common type you'll see, other than the London pattern, is uh, something like a double horned anvil, where you'll have a round horn on one side and a square horn off the other side. This is the heel of the anvil. So this part that overhangs the back, the heel of your anvil. And I think that kind of takes you through all the different standard nomenclature for a, at least London pattern anvil. Let's take a look at a coal forge. We'll take a brief look at another coal forge as well. Uh, so you can see some of the ways that they can be different. But let's go through the general terminology for a coal forge. This unit itself, kind of overall, is called a forge. This top area here is going to be your working surface. A nice big working surface is handy because it gives you plenty of room to keep excess coal, um, to have pieces that you're working on. Looking into the center, we've got the fire pot. The fire pot is where your fire is going to be, right? It's a pot of fire. Down at the bottom, we you'll normally see um, either a grate like this has. Um, this one is actually designed to be used with a clinker breaker. So I've got a clinker breaker arm here that I can swivel and move that back and forth in order to clear up my airway. Sometimes it's just going to have a grill or something like that on it. The clinker breaker might look very different. This one is actually pretty unique. The real goal of the fire pot, though, is shaping your fire correctly. So as the air comes in, either the bottom or the side of the fire, depending on what type of uh, forge you've got, you're going to have a lot of oxygen as it initially comes in. What you want is a fire that's designed so that oxygen can be burned away, giving you all the heat that you need. But then as you bring your steel in, your steel is going to be in an area of very low oxygen where the fire has burned up almost all of the oxygen already. That will reduce the amount of scale that you get. So this fire pot shape is pretty important, right? And this is, I think, one of the real advantages of having a purpose-made fire pot as opposed to something like um, a brake rotor or a brake drum. Looking around the forge, if we go down to the bottom, we're gonna see this, which is called the tweer. That's the section that joins the pipe coming from your blower. Um, and this splits the airflow uh, on these bottom forges, or uh, bottom tweer forges anyway, into the air going up and also provides a spot for the ash dump. This one's designed that you've got to reach down there and swing it out of the way. We'll take a look at another one that works in a different way. Continuing on then, right, we've got some sort of connector pipe and that's going to connect to a blower. I've got a lot of uh, hand crank blowers out here. And as you spin this, assuming that your ash dump is closed, it's gonna blow that air up into the bottom of your fire and give you the heat that you need. So that is a look at the general terminology for a coal forge. Let's take another look at a different coal forge and we'll see how the ash dump and the clinker breaker uh, work a little bit differently. Different forge, this one's got a Centaur Forge mini fire pot in it. Also has a clinker breaker. This clinker breaker is designed to spin around. It's a little wedge shape, which can control the amount of airflow you've got. In one direction, it's gonna allow more air to pass through it. In another direction, it allows a little bit less air. This one also has a different uh, ash dump on it. Down here, we've got a ball. We push that up, the ash drops out. These are nice because they're easy to hit um, and they stay closed when you're done with them. So you can just kick it up, let the ash fall out. That covers all of the, the different parts of a coal or charcoal forge. Um, there are a lot, of, a lot of variations on this, right? You could have side blast. Um, you could even get move away into something like propane or induction forges, which have their own terminology. But for the Bana, what you're typically looking at with a uh, forge, I'm gonna leave it with those terms. Um, if there are other types of forges that you're interested, let me know uh, with a comment and I'll tell you what all the names for those different parts are too. Let's go take a look at a vise now. We've got um, one of the last, uh, but really top essential pieces of blacksmithing kit, which is the leg or post vise 
named leg or post vise because it sits on a post or a leg. Um, this is really a unique specialized blacksmithing tool. You'll see a lot of folks uh, with machinist vices and things like that. And the big difference between a machinist vise and this leg or post vise is the fact that this is designed to be hammered on. A bench mounted vise is not. There's a piece of kind of specialized uh, design, right? If we look at this back jaw right here, and if you want to come in close, you'll see that my screw moves freely in there, right? It is not attached. The jaw here at the top comes down, it swells out and around, and it continues on until it goes down into the ground where I've got it supported on a steel plate. That means that I can come in with a sledgehammer and a piece of hot steel in there, and I can do some work on this um, vise. And any power, any uh, shock that's going into the vise is going to bypass my screw and go straight into the ground. A machinist vise, if you do this, you will just break the vise and it will stop opening and closing. So, as we take a look at the terminology then, they're really pretty simple. We've got the jaws up here at the top. We've got the screw and the handle, which we can, there's a little notch here. If you open these up too far, right, we can close this up. This screw, by the way, is really the most important thing. If you're looking at a vise, debating whether or not to buy one, if that screw is in good shape, then you're probably in good shape with that vise. Most of the rest of this, um, you can fabricate on your own. Moving down uh, from the vise, we've got, like I said, the screw. Down here, we've got um, the spring. This is what opens and opens the vise as you unscrew it. And we've got the leg of the vise. And that's pretty much all the main terminology that you need to know for the post vise. Once you've got your anvil, once you've got your hammer, and you've got your forge, this is probably the next thing that you want to go spend money on and try and make sure that you've got one uh, that you can mount somewhere securely so that as you do that hammering on it, you know, the force is going down into the ground and you're not going to damage anything. I think that covers all of the terminology that we need for section 1.2 of the national curriculum. Thank you guys uh, for going through this with me. I know it's not the most exciting just going through the terminology and the different parts of things, but it is essential if you're a new blacksmith to know what these things are called. We'll be taking a look next at 1.3, which is all about hammers, how to swing them, and different types of hammer blows. See you soon.